committee will come to order. As this hearing is uh, fairly, uh, fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show you how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time, the hearing is called to order, will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time, the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. Good morning to our panel. I am pleased to welcome the Chief of Capitol Police, Tom Manger, the uh, Manger, the House Sergeant at Arms, William Walker, and the Architect of the Capitol, Brett Blanton. Thank you for being with us today. None of us will ever forget the events of January 6th. The Capitol was attacked by violent insurrection. Lives were lost in the days and weeks following. 140 police officers were assaulted. One and a half million dollars worth of damage was done to the Capitol. And the lasting impacts of that day continue to be felt across the Capitol complex and our community. How we remember and respond will determine how we collectively learn from the trials and mistakes that day. As we move forward, we do not want to fall into the trap of preparing to fight the last war. Rather, we must thoughtfully plan to ensure the next one never happens. Ignoring the mistakes of the past or refusing to learn and grow from them will only continue to leave the Capitol campus vulnerable to unknown and unexpected threats. A lot of important work remains to get to the bottom of what happened that day and I commend my colleagues on the select committee who are engaged in that very important work. The purpose of this subcommittee and this hearing specifically is not to litigate the facts of that day. Our purpose today is to review where we are one year later and what changes have been made since January 6, 2021, and to look ahead as what is still needed to keep members, staff, visitors, Capitol Police, and all employees on campus safe. In May 2021, the House passed a comprehensive security supplemental bill with significant investments in the Capitol Police, security improvements, and member security. But after inaction in the Senate, a slimmed down compromise bill was agreed to in July of 2021. Unfortunately, this included only $300 million of earmarked funding for the architect of the Capitol for windows and doors and new security cameras, and $70.7 million for the U.S. Capitol Police salaries, equipment, and other expenses related to the January 6th insurrection. In all, the short-sighted version that could get support from the Republicans in the Senate did not include other items, such as backfilling, the funding reprogrammed away from other vital activities in the aftermath of the attack. Funding for security screening vestibules, landscape architecture, and retractable security barriers to protect the Capitol complex, and resources to improve member security and security in district offices. Today, I hope you can provide updates to the subcommittee as to how Capitol Police Sergeant at Arms, 
are currently protecting the campus and its workforce. And to talk about the next steps to ensure the future physical safety of our campus. What changes have been made to improve the safety of doors and windows? What plans are in place to ensure a mob cannot again overrun access points in the Capitol? What efforts have been taken to recruit and retain additional Capitol police officers? Simply, how is the Capitol a safer place to work one year later? This subcommittee is interested in hearing about both how those supplemental funds are being spent and what gaps remain. On top of that, I need you to address the consequences to the safety and security of the Capitol complex if the FY 2022 regular appropriation is not enacted. As you all know, the continuing resolution runs out on February 18th, and there are those who believe it is better to punt instead of doing the hard work of funding the government. What are the repercussions to the legislative branch if the 2022 bill is not enacted and we are stuck with a continuing resolution at FY 2021 funding levels? I look forward to your answers to the questions I have raised and I want you to know that we are very thankful for your service and that, and that of the staff of your organizations who work so hard to make this house run. At this point, I would like to yield to my friend and colleague, if she is here, Ranking Member Jamie Herrera Butler, for any opening comments she would like to make. And if not, Thanks. this is new house. Can, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me okay? Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and thank you, General Walker, uh, Chief Manger, and Mr. Blinn for being here today. Um, <clears throat> you know, I echo Chairman Ryan's uh, thanks for everything that you do. We will be forever grateful for the heroic actions of your officers, your employees on January 6th of last year. And we're also grateful for the actions of the Metropolitan Police Department in, from DC, um, the National Guard and the other numerous other law enforcement agencies that came to the aid of the Capitol and um, and as well as we're grateful to their families at home. Um, they did a lot for us and for this nation. The security threats that are facing the legislative branch are growing and they're changing. Uh, after 9-11, we were primarily concerned about foreign terrorist groups. And since January 6th, those foreign terrorist groups and the violent domestic uh, groups on the right and on the left have revealed that um, there are a lot of vulnerabilities at the U.S. Capitol. We must make changes to ensure that no groups can successfully attack the U.S. Capitol or individual members. Um, political violence has absolutely no place in our society, our democracy, or our legislative process. And I hear this over and over again over the last year. I've heard so many people say, you know, this group's been doing it, so this group can do it, or this group's been doing it, so this this makes this okay. And that's, I always come back to, um, when is it ever okay? That's, that's the function of our democracy. That's the thing that sets us apart and makes us different. It's never okay. Over the past year, Congress has provided both funding and reforms to assist you in protecting the Capitol complex. Uh, through the Security Supplemental Appropriations Bill, uh, there was provided funds for immediate personnel and supply needs of the Capitol Police and security enhancements for the Capitol building itself. Uh, we also have provided the Capitol Police uh, Chief the authority to unilaterally request National Guard and other agency support in an emergency. Um, we need to ensure that the brave officers who are protecting the Capitol and the functions of the legislative branch have the appropriate training and, and equipment. They should never again face circumstances like January 6th. Um, we need to ensure that the leadership in place uh, is, is, provi is providing actual leadership and support and, and has been trained in these types of circumstances to provide security coordination for, for large scale and just routine events. Um, I believe we need to ensure that intelligence is gathered, disseminated, and acted upon <clears throat> in a productive way. And these changes don't just take funding. Um, they require the leadership of each, each of you who is here to testify today. And that's what we're excited to hear about. Uh, we wanna hear about how the security supplemental funding is being used and if there are any additional funding or legislative requirements necessary to secure the legislative branch and its activities. Security is fundamental 
It's up to you, the members of the Capitol Police Board and your agencies to provide assurance, that assurance so that we may carry out our constitutional duty representing the American people without obstruction or fear. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Herrera Butler. Uh, next is the chair of the full committee, Representative Rosa DeLora. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I just thank you both for the hearing this morning. And I want to say a thank you to our guests, to General Walker, uh, to Chief of Police Manger, and to uh, Mr. Blanton uh, for. Uh, testifying today. Uh, on January 6, 2021, our nation uh, gazed into the abyss uh, and understood more fully than ever before that democracy and our democracy is fragile. A year later, it is still difficult to comprehend the gravity of this attack on our democracy. And I will never forget that amid this insurrection, Capitol Police told us to, quote, hit the floor and grab the gas masks under our seats as the mob headed for the House chamber. Because of these brave women and men, our democracy proved its resilience, our institutions withstood the threat, and we overcame the chaos. In recognition of their sacrifice and to uphold our responsibility to protect the Republic, this committee passed into law almost a billion dollars to fund the Capitol Police and secure the United States Capitol, the citadel of democracy. With funding provided in the security supplemental, the Capitol Police have made changes over the past year in five critical areas, training, equipment and personnel, operational planning, the civil disturbance unit, and intelligence and incident command. But they still need our help. One year after the horrors of that day, the Capitol Police are still recovering. While their physical wounds mo may have healed, there is still so much more they will need to rebuild. Over the past year, 135 Capitol Police officers have retired or resigned, leaving the force dangerously depleted. Those serious manpower challenges have also made it harder to take officers away from their posts for the training they need. For instance, I've heard directly from officers that they need more and more frequent trainings. And I heard from one uh, on January 6th uh, about training in the Capitol itself uh, and that we haven't done anything like that by way of training since 2007. So especially training within the Capitol. We also know that the Capitol Police itself has identified the need for more training, um, more training staff, and a larger training facility that could better accommodate the force's size and mission. I also understand that while progress has been made, there continue to be concerns about the adequacy of equipment for officers to protect themselves and this institution. And I hope we can discuss that today. Finally, my colleagues and I have continuing concerns about the security uh, for a uh, uh, of uh, um, members and our office staff in our districts. That came up over and over again uh, from members about uh, the sense of their security and the security of their families in districts. And while uh, the House included in the House proposal in the security supplemental, there was funding for member security uh, and, and, uh, and in their districts as well. That funding was outrageously, in my view, stripped in the US Senate. The number of potential threats has only grown. So sooner or later, we will have to address this issue. And we want to hear your perspective on that matter. While we have already passed a security supplemental, we can continue to provide funding and oversight through this subcommittee's, um, through this su subcommittee's efforts uh, here. Um, and, um, uh, we have voted in this committee to increase uh, the uh, funding uh, by $88.4 million. Uh, but this is being held up uh, as uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are refusing to negotiate the appropriations bills. That intransigence 
is keeping the Capitol Police stuck at last year's funding levels and denying these heroes the resources they need to keep the Capitol and all who work uh, and visit here safe. As the architect of the Capitol, uh, Mr. Blanton uh, 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 put in his, uh, uh, his testimony that delayed funding for projects has consequences. I believe it is time for my Republican colleagues to work with Democrats on government funding legislation that supports the brave men and women of the Capitol Police. We need to honor their sacrifice by providing the certainty that comes with sufficient annual funding. Uh, we need to have this conference process begin, and I hope that we can use the insights from this hearing to shape the final legislation. We want to hear from you to our witnesses. What do you need? How can we help? What reforms, including the Capitol Police Board, must happen? By having these discussions, we can continue the long process of helping our community to heal, and by doing so, we can keep on moving forward, persisting in our quest to build a more perfect union. And with that, I thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler, and I yield back. I thank the Chairwoman. Uh, without objection, your written testimonies will be made part of the record. Once the statements are complete, we will move to the question and answer period. I ask that the panel uh, to please summarize your statements and highlight your efforts to the committee. We will begin with uh, Chief Manger. And after his statements, we will turn to Sergeant at Arms Walker for his statement, and then we'll conclude with Architect of the Capitol, Blanton. Chief, please begin. Thank you. Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, and st distinguished members of the committee, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak about the significant improvements we've made follow following the events of January 6, 2021, and to speak about the work that remains to be done. I want to begin by acknowledging the men and women of the Capitol Police who work so tirelessly to fulfill their mission of protecting the United States Capitol, the members of Congress, and the legislative process every day. And while I'm proud of our officers, the events of January 6th did expose critical department failures and deficiencies with operational planning, intelligence, staffing, and equipment. I'm pleased to report that we have addressed a significant portion of the many recommendations issued to the department. In fact, of the more than 100 recommendations issued by the Inspector General, we've implemented are in the, or are in the process of addressing over 90 of them. However, there is more work to be done. I also want to thank this committee for its support in providing the department the resources needed to address its critical needs. One of the most critical failures identified in the wake of January 6th was the lack of a department-wide operational plan for the joint session. An, an important first step we took to address that concern was onboarding a former Secret Service official with extensive experience in major event and national special security event planning. Guided by his expertise, we now take a multi-phased approach to our planning process with a focus on information gathering, intelligence, asset determination, internal coordination, and most importantly, department-wide dissemination of all intelligence and critical information before all large and high-risk events. This includes the creation of the department's first critical incident response plan, which now allows us to more effectively and more quickly obtain assistance from our partner agencies. In short, a blueprint for operational planning has been created and put into place for all significant future events. If January 6th taught us anything, it's that preparation matters. Immediately after the 6th, the department focused on the need to strengthen our frontline officers, the Civil Disturbance Unit, or CDU. For any demonstrations that involve the potential for violence, the need for a well-trained, well-equipped CDU is crucial. Recognizing the tactical importance of our CDU officers, we developed a plan to create eight hard platoons and incentivize officers to remain in the unit. These platoons will be permanent units whose members train together and are deployed together. Of course, our first responders can't do their job without proper equipment. Therefore, we have reviewed all CDU equipment and with the assistance of this committee are upgrading the equipment to protect our officers and enhance our ability for crowd control. Few changes are as dramatic as the ones that we've made in the way we gather, 
analyze, share, use, and disseminate intelligence. Improvements to the department's lead intelligence component, the Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, began before January 6th. These improvements include a nationwide search for a permanent intelligence director, and we're actually only a, a couple weeks away from making that selection, the development of the United States Capitol Police intelligence product that is now shared with the intelligence community, the issuance of a daily intelligence report distributed to all officers and officials, biweekly classified intelligence briefings, coordination with intelligence and law enforcement partners in advance of large or high profile events. And we've increased our staffing by eight intelligence analysts since January 6th. We continue to be forward looking in our efforts to ensure that the department has a strong and proven intelligence collection, analysis, and dissemination program. I want to thank all of you for your ongoing support during this process. I also acknowledge and appreciate the support that we have received from the Capitol Police Board. Today, I'm confident that the United States Capitol Police Department has made significant progress in addressing the deficiencies that impacted the department's response on January 6th. And while more work remains to be done, the men and women of the Capitol Police stand ready to fulfill their mission each and every day. Thank you, Chief General. Good morning, Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, Chair DeLaurel, and members of the Appropriations Subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today and thank you for your ongoing support. It's an honor and privilege to serve this great institution. Before I begin, I must acknowledge the debt of gratitude we owe the United States Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police Department, the National Guard, and all the many law enforcement officers who came to support the Capitol Police and defend democracy a year ago. We must remember those we have lost over the past year, Officer Brian Sicknick, Officer Howard Livingood, and Officer Billy Evans, all of the United States Capitol Police. And remember that many officers continue to bear scars from that fateful day, some seen and some unseen. However, their steadfast commitment to this institution serves as a powerful inspiration to all of us. And I am fortunate to work collaboratively with the brave and dedicated officers of the United States Capitol Police. Let me get right to the bottom line. We are unquestionably safer today than we were a year ago today. The question is, are we safe enough? The answer is work remains. Because the threat landscape today is ever changing, the security of the United States Capitol, its members, their staff, and our visitors is a never ending journey, not a destination. To meet the security challenges posed by the constantly evolving threat, the Office of the House of Sergeant at Arms and the United States Capitol Police and our partners, the architect of the Capitol, and the chief administrative officer, we all must collaboratively work hard and be ever vigilant and proactive. What has changed? The House Sergeant at Arms is leveraging human resources and technology and partnerships like never before to provide the safest and most secure atmosphere possible. We have hired security subject matter experts from the United States Secret Service, the United States Intelligence Community, the Department of Homeland Security, and other agencies. These experts have deep knowledge, broad experience, and a history of success protecting people, property, and data. These personnel additions supplement the existing dedicated and professional HSAA House Sergeant and Arms staff that we already have. Member security is my highest priority. The way I'm approaching this, member security has five dimensions. Member security at the United States Capitol, member security at the residence, member security during their travel, events in their districts, and the overall threats to members. After January 6, all spaces within the Capitol complex occupied by members have access to duress alarms. So that's security in the Capitol. I request resources for every member to have a state-of-the-art 
home security package at their residence in the District of Columbia in the metropolitan area and in their district residence back home. I also request resources for a member travel operations center to support all domestic and foreign travel by members. This would build on newly created partnerships with the Department of Homeland Security, specifically the Transportation Security Administration and the Department of State, specifically the Overseas Security Advisory Council, which the House Sergeant at Arms has joined. And this is helping us regarding threats to member travel. For events in each member's district, I strongly, strongly recommend a standardized suite of training for all district law enforcement coordinators be completed. My office is developing new training protocols to include videos for district coordinators. The topics include security awareness, threat and risk assessments, and risk mitigation strategies. I further recommend that the coordinators be either a former law enforcement officer or someone with strong relationships and network in the local law enforcement community. Ideally, uh, I would like somebody that is a retired law enforcement officer uh, with HR 218 uh, um, able to carry a weapon uh, under, under the provisions of HR 218. The coordinator would routinely meet with local law enforcement to assess security for members. My plan would include re-energizing regional and national district coordinator security conferences that would be attended by the United States Capitol Police leadership and House uh, Sergeant at Arms staff to ensure coordinators are kept up to date on the latest security solutions. I believe threats to members should also be deterred through the aggressive identification and prosecution of offenders. The unprecedented number of threats must be addressed and disincentivized. The identification, arrest, prosecution, punishment, and publicity surrounding the adjudication of people making threats against members will make clear this behavior will not be tolerated. When I served as a special agent of the Drug Enforcement Administration, we had agent attorneys who supplemented U.S. attorney's offices. They were made special assistant U.S. attorneys. The FBI and other agencies also uh, follow this practice, and it is to, to go after and prosecute the cases when there's a backlog. I shared this concept with the United States Capitol Police, and I am pleased to tell you, to share with you, that, that they have followed it and they have hired attorneys who are assisting with the backlog of uh, prosecutions against individuals making threats to members of Congress. Really thrilled about that. This has to stop. It is a huge number one priority of, me, of mine. In addition, we are also working in concert with the United States uh, intelligence community to facilitate the gathering of threats against members. We are collaborating with the Department of Justice on prosecutions. The objective is to more effectively integrate state and local prosecutors in bringing those making threats against members to justice. What I mean by that, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that there are counties in the United States uh, that uh, at the local level, it is a crime and we need to come after this holistically. And if we can't go after you, uh, an offender federally, we need to do it state or, or at the county level. My objective is to, uh, so with this objective, I like to ask members to urge the Department of Justice to, to provide their full support and assistance to all prosecutable threats made against members. I really believe this is um, something that we have to stop before something tragic happens. Threats against members must be an enforcement priority for the Department of Justice, as well as state and local and county uh, jurisdictions. Another priority of mine is the hardening of the capital, both physically and electronically. We're working collaboratively with the United States Capitol Police Board, the architect of the Capitol, uh, who can more fully com comment on the physical security assessments underway, and the chief uh, administrative officer on uh, the cyber threats that are facing the uh, Capitol. Identity access management is also an, an initiative 
that uh, will increase security at the Capitol. Working in collaboration with the subcommittee and the Capitol Police, I'd like to institute a Capitol Access Verification verification Entry System. I'm calling it CAVES. If this takes off, it would, it would allow the members to know who is coming into the Capitol. It's not telling members you can't bring an individual in, but you should know about this, about who's coming to visit you. Just like credit card companies know their customers, we should know our visitors. So that that's another thing that I have. Uh, am I out of time? I see the red up there. Yeah, let's start wrapping up, General. Okay. okay. All right. We'll get, we'll get so, through a lot of this questions yes, too. So. Yes, sir. The last of my security priorities is the establishment of capital security officers. The capital security officer concept is based on the United States Marshal Service use of court security officers to augment deputy marshals which protect judges and courtrooms in the 94 judicial districts in the United States. So the, I have, uh, we briefed the Capitol Police Board and I'm working with the Capitol Police to, toward implementation. So I'll just uh, summarize. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you all this morning. I'm appreciative of your unyielding support and the partnerships we are developing to enhance security of the complex and its members. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General Architect of uh, the Capitol, Blanton. Thank you, Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Harvard Butler, Chair Delario, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and I truly appreciate the support of the subcommittee in protecting the Capitol after the events of January 6. As you hear, all of our panelists are united in our efforts to make the capital safe, secure, and open. I can honestly say we are safer today than we were on January 5th. However, there is more to do. As I reflect upon the somber events last week, I remain focused on ongoing efforts to demonstrate our collective strength and resolve. U.S. Capitol is a symbol of Western democracy. It is among the most significant architectural buildings in the entire world. With your ongoing support, we can protect and preserve this cherished institution as well as all those who serve here. In doing so, we cannot forget the heroic actions of the Capitol Police, Sergeant Arms staff, and my staff on January 6th. During those harrowing hours, AOC personnel sheltered congressional staff in our shops. Staff raced to reverse the airflow to clear the air of chemical irritants within the Capitol. We set up eyewash stations and provided water for Capitol Police officers in need. Once the security officials cleared the building, AOC employees worked tirelessly to clean up and begin repairs. Carpenters covered windows and doors with plywood. Laborers removed glass and broken furniture. Hatters material crews cleaned up pepper spray, bear repellent, and fire extinguisher residue. Through their resilient and unwavering efforts, AOC staff ensured Congress could go back to work and while Congress was doing his job, AOC staff worked nonstop to finalize preparations for the 59th presidential inauguration. The pace was urgent and immediate. In order to address these needs, we received congressional approval to transfer funds from other important projects so that repair work and an essential security assessment could be completed right away. Over the past year, in close coordination with the Capitol Police, as well as the House and Senate Sergeant Arms, AOC staff has improved security measures across campus. While some of these changes are more visible than others, we have worked continuously throughout the pandemic to keep the Capitol safe. We know our efforts are critical to the safety of members and staff working to the, on the Capitol campus. We are proud of the role we play in ensuring continuity of operations. At the same time, you all know well the growing costs associated with the pandemic, including bulk purchasing of personal protective inventory and testing kits is draining our agency's resources. We're extremely appreciative of the funds you provided for the Pandemic Response and CARES Act and the Security Supplemental. Looking ahead, we hope to continue working with you to address ongoing needs. Our fiscal year 2023 budget request will reflect projects related to security needs of Congress, the Supreme Court, and the entire Capitol complex. We will also seek funding for projects previously approved by Congress that were put on hold as a result of the budget transfer that I mentioned earlier. As the subcommittee considers future campus-wide security improvements, 
AOC will need adequate resources to support our partners in the Capitol Police. It is imperative to consider the additional requirements and costs levied on the AOC to support our partners in these campus wide initiatives. And while physical security improvements are a top priority, I am also committed to maintaining a positive work environment where people have the skills, training, equipment, and support to serve Congress on behalf of the American people. I'd like to take a moment to express my deep appreciation to all AOC employees. Every day, continually impressed and inspired by the level of commitment, resilience, professionalism displayed by our employees. The Capitol is an exceptionally re resilient, both in terms of physical structure and its people. We on the Capitol Police Board share a common obligation to protect and preserve this international symbol of democracy. I am confident our Capitol will continue to stand the test of time. I look forward to continuing collaboration with my colleagues to vigilantly and effectively achieve this goal. On behalf of all our Capitol staff, I thank you for, again for your support and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Blanton. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to kick it off here. I asked a couple of questions in my uh, opening statement that uh, we'll, we'll get to. Uh, though I'm hoping you can touch upon those, but specifically on the impact of a continuing resolution to your offices. What would that What would that mean if you could each give us uh, an answer on that? We can. We'll go in reverse order, uh, Mr. Blanton, since we have you on the screen. Uh, you know. We're very frustrated about the continuing resolution and be interested in your your uh, views on the impact of it. Thank you. My largest concern with the continuing resolution is actually with the Canon project. We need to have money this summer in order to award the next phase of the Canon project. And if that is delayed, that is going to end up affecting a move cycle where we won't be able to complete the project within the two year time frame that is required for each phase of the project. There are also additional projects that are, that are concerning to me. Uh, lighting upgrades on the Capitol Plaza, some more security infrastructure, um, and then update upgrades to the sprinkler system within the Capitol so that, so that we actually have a fire code approved building. And any continued delays will just delay the implementation of any of these projects. When you said the uh, the security projects, which which ones would be affected you by the CR? Uh, barriers and kiosks for the Capitol Police and truck interdiction systems. Okay. General. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, for. The greatest impact for the House Sergeant in Arms is going to be our inability to hire talent. As everybody knows, there's a war for talent, and we're trying to um, acquire security professionals. That that's the biggest thing, and it may be some uh, impact on our travel to uh, go out and do assessments of um, security assessments that we've been doing could affect our police services. But number one would be uh, hiring individuals. And, and that's pretty much all I have right now, sir. Chief. Well, the continuing resolution would would impact just about everything that we're doing to uh, make and sustain improvements, um, especially in the areas of intelligence, threat analysis, dignitary protection, uh, critical security infrastructure, all those areas where we have, in, have increased work uh, load demands because of the sixth and, and the recommendations that have we've received. As a result of the sixth, it would it would suspend our health and wellness initiatives, which are uh, very robust. It would end our student loan repayment program. But the biggest impact um, would be our inability to increase our staffing. You'll see in our FY22 and FY23 budget, we're asking for 288 new recruit officers, and our plan is to hire 288 uh, new recruit officers in both those years um, to get ahead of attrition. This basically would leave us in a position where all we could do is replace the officers that have left. Uh, we've got to get ahead of attrition. Uh, staffing is our biggest challenge that we that remains. Okay. Great. Uh, Ms. Herrera Butler. Thank you, Chairman Ryan. And I, I think it's important since 
right now we're spending a lot of time talking about the CR that the Democrats passed out of the House that's being negotiated. Um, I think it's important to note that um, Republicans are very happy to negotiate that. I think CRs are as detrimental as the next person. Um, however, I do think what I've heard from our colleagues in the Senate um, that you know there are there are policies that the Democrats are going to have to come to the table on longstanding protections like Hyde, um, national defense and border security. Um, you know there there are some pretty big high level issues that need to be addressed. So I think if my friends are very interested in making sure that 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 we don't end up with a CR, they should. Uh, make sure that their counterparts in the Senate are willing to do that negotiating because, um, like I said, it came out of the House. It's done. I don't I don't think CRs are a good idea, but I also think that there needs to be a, if they want um, that bipartisan support, there needs to be some bipartisan effort put into the bills. Um, and I want to take it back a little bit to to where where we're at with with regard to, um, uh, you know, uh, the the AOC. I know in the last year that we've been asked for s large sums of money. There's been money that's been moved from account to account to cover the cost of the fence, you know, to cover immediate needs. And I have been supportive of those things uh, pretty much as you've asked, um, <clears throat> Mr. Blanton. And, and part of that is because I do trust, you know, one of the things you've asked for is money for a comprehensive security review. And I gotta say, I'm a little frustrated that um, I, I have not, our offices, and, and I don't know if the, the majority has, um, maybe the minority hasn't seen it. I did talk with our, our counterparts on the authorizing side of this committee. Uh, it, updates on how the money that we've let this year, the $10 million, the security assessment, updates specifically on how that money has been spent. Um, maybe it hasn't been spent, maybe it, it isn't completely expended or you have plans for it, but I, I haven't gotten, you know, I, I hear you saying we need more support and I'm, I am ready to step up on that front, but I haven't actually heard the details of what's been done to date, especially with that specific assessment. Could you provide a little clarity? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. The, so the assessment is complete. It's a uh, well over 2000 pages. And what we're doing now is uh, doing a, a executive summary of it so that we can provide that executive summary and say if you want to see the 2000 pages we'll have that um, in the skiffs so we, we there were some uh mm -hmm. delays with the, the completion it was completed in in late december and so the the um the executive summary should be coming out shortly so, I, I understand step. delays. I, I definitely understand that. Um, that everybody, you know, everybody here who's taken on and assumed some folks have assumed new roles in leading an agency that needs a lot of fixing. I think it, there's just a, I have a little bit of frustration. I've heard a little bit of frustration that um, we're being told we aren't quite providing everything. But as far as I know, we haven't even gotten the update on what your recommendations are. And I'm anxious to see that because I think your campus wide assessment is critical um, to putting in place the you know soup to nuts the the whole deal uh, for security of the u.s capitol i'm going to switch gears really quick to the capitol police leadership and i know i think it's like six of the the highest the the 11 members of the capitol police leadership team have left for various reasons there's morale issues um in the department and it's been heavily scrutinized <laughs> um I wanted to see Chief Manger if your what your plan is to fill some of these vacancies and i just honestly overall what can be done to restore some of that morale. I know that we're over 130 officers have left the department this year. I know this is happening nationwide. I, I can tell you finding talent has been a huge issue. Um, and, and I wanted to know if you're looking at um, hiring folks outside of the normal scope, you know, ex secret service agents, uh, folks from Homeland Security, people who have been trained, and, and if there are any impediments there, because we need to do what we can at least to get, at least to hit attrition. We got to at least tackle that hurdle. So over to you. So um, thank you. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, it's three questions uh, leadership, morale, <laughs> and hiring. So let me, let me hit all three of them. First of all, uh, the first thing I did when I got here um, was to assess my leadership that I had. And as you pointed out, um, six out of the top 11 people in the organization had left. Uh, the chief, both sergeant of arms had, had uh, gone the day after January 6th. But for the Capitol Police, 
We lost the, uh, uh, the, the assistant chief who was in charge of operational planning on the 6th, gone. The director of intelligence, gone. The director of security services, gone. Um, two deputy chiefs uh, retired. And so uh, I, I, more than 50% of the senior staff uh, was, was not here when I got here. So um, what I, my biggest uh, task was to assess the leadership that I had. I wanted to determine who's just waiting around to see what's gonna happen and who has been working since January 7th to try and uh, improve the failures uh, of this department. And um, the folks that, that have remained, uh, I have great confidence in. Uh, they've done a great deal of work, uh, and some of these folks include people that um, had the the a vote of no confidence, um, and I understand that. But a vote of no confidence, while it's important, it's an important statement by the union. It is not an objective performance evaluation. And what I did coming in, I had no preconceived notions, but um, I have uh, the 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 folks that I have are 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 working their tails off. Um, there's more to be done. Um, we've got to replace those folks. So I think there's there's strong talent within the organization, but I also uh, believe that bringing folks from in from the outside is still an option that I, that I'm considering, and um, we'll we'll move forward. And I'll keep certainly keep the committee apprised of my decisions uh, as we move forward. In terms of morale, um, that morale is a difficult issue. It's uh, morale's what I've learned in 43 years of being a cop is morale's in the eye of the beholder. You're going to have some cops that um, that uh, who, who took this job, they had expectations, and then when they get here, they find out that the job's more difficult than they thought it was going to be, and they have to sort of reconcile that. And and um, I, I've tried to tell you know tried to um, uh, tell my folks over and over since I've been here that. The people we serve appreciate what we do and um, what we've got to do. What I think my responsibility is to restore the confidence that these officers, I want these officers to have in the department. The department let them down on January 6th. We've got to restore that confidence and I'm doing everything we can to address that. Uh, you know, the supplemental, there were a number of things in there. Uh, hazard pay, retention bonus, student loan repayment, a specialty pay for civil disturbance unit, um, health and wellness initiatives. The supplemental allowed us to do all those things. Um, my hope is that they have had some impact on morale, but um, we're, uh, we still got, again, more work to be done there. Last issue, the hiring. Um, you know, we're, we've got a, a goal of trying to hire 288 people this year, 288 people next year. We got to get ahead of attrition. Um, one of the reasons we're, we're so far behind is, as was mentioned, 100, over 130 people left last year or, or since January 6th. But the year prior, COVID <clears throat> closed down our, our uh, the um, our training academy in Georgia. We weren't able to get any new hires through in 2020. So you've got a year where we can't, where we get very few new officers, another year where we lose 130. That's what's put us in such a difficult position in terms of staffing. The good news is we're not, ha we, we put a lot of recruitment uh, initiatives together. We're not having any, tr getting, having any trouble getting people to apply. The challenge is to make sure we hire the right people. And I think that um, we're doing our best to, to make sure we hire people that have integrity, a spirit for public service, courage, compassion, emotional intelligence. These are the qualities we're looking for and my hope is that we're continue we, that we continue to be able to hire good people um, to uh, be Capitol Police officers. In terms of leadership, uh, again, as I said before, um, I think we've got good talent internally, but we also need to look outside to see if there's good folks that we can bring in. Thank you. Yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chairwoman DeLauro. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our, our witnesses um, uh, and, and the speed and alacrity with which you moved uh, in the uh, chaos, uh, the aftermath of, uh, uh, of January of January 6th uh, and the changes that you have made uh, and including that we were unable to get you all of the money that the House proposed um, in that first, uh, uh, in our supplemental, and money was taken out. So now, what we want to do is to figure out where the where the uh, gaps are and and be able to uh, help fill those. I have to say something quickly before I ask my two questions, which is about the state of the negotiations on the omnibus. Um, I, I think it's important to note 
that to date that there has not been a uh, the democratic proposals as reflected in the bills that are out there, all 12 appropriations bills um, in the House and in the Senate. Um, but to date, there has not been a Republican counter offer or an offer of what um, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle would like to see in uh, an omnibus going forward. And we continue to ask for that. And my hope is that we will uh, get there. With regard to the policy um, uh, uh, riders, et cetera, uh, just for clarification, the normal process of the Appropriations Committee historically, and I've served on the committee uh, for some uh, 25, 26 years, is that you deal with uh, uh, dealing with the top line, uh, getting the numbers on defense and non-defense uh, laid out uh, and programmatically go down, and then you deal uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with the riders. Uh, to say that we would not enter conversations about top line, et cetera, without um, uh, the dismissal of all the policy issues uh, is unprecedented. Uh, in addition to which, um, we have to have a thorough uh, review, debate, and discussion of all of those in order to come out with a, um, a bicameral but bipartisan piece of legislation. So just to clear the record, and if I can, I'd like to get to uh, uh, two questions. Chief Manger, um, um, uh, I, I want to say thank you uh, no, no member or staff members uh, were physically injured on January 6th, okay? Now, you note in your testimony that without the restrictions of COVID-19, the Capitol would have been open to the public on January 6th. Um, and so, uh, and, and that's safe to estimate that there have been thousands of more people in the Capitol that day, if not for COVID-19. Uh, can you describe how the police response on the 6th would have been different? With such a substantial increase in population at the Capitol, do you suspect the same results in terms of overall safety? Is the funding that was included in the security supplemental significant enough to ensure the U.S. Capitol Police is prepared to respond to such an attack um, um, with the Capitol at full staff capacity? Uh, just to, and, and quickly for you, Chief, and for General Walker, the issue of, uh, of in-district um, uh, funding uh, for members and district offices and families. Uh, we know that there are uh, about 10,000 threats. Uh, if you can describe, Chief, the detail in detail, the steps the U.S. Capitol Police is taking to ensure that all threats are investigated. And General Walker, um, uh, uh, in your testimony, you recommend standardized training for the district law enforcement coordinators. Are there other security enhancements needed for members and staff? To remain safe in their districts uh, is additional funding necessary for such protection. So, um, Chief Manger, if you will begin, and then uh, General Walker. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the uh, uh, supplemental um, did a great deal to help us. In fact, I, I'm not sure how we'd be able to have made many of the improvements uh, without that. Um, I mentioned earlier all the th the retention bonus, hazard bonus, uh, the the uh, funding to. Uh, uh, pay overtime to officers. Um, this this has helped us just day-to-day -day operationally and helped us retain officers um, who might otherwise uh, have left. Uh, but in addition, uh, it's given us um, the ability to ensure that we can order the equipment and get the equipment that our uh, officers needed. Um, the civil disturbance unit officers, we've ordered state-of-the-art equipment for them and um, that uh, should be, we're expecting, some of it has come in, the, we, we expect it all to be in uh, within this month uh, is our hope, and we'll get that out to our folks. But the one thing I, do, I should say that, that none of our civil service unit officers, uh, if, if anything happened today, would be going out there without equipment. If, if we don't have equipment for the folks, we're not deploying them as CDU officers, which is what happened on the 6th. Um, th there's, uh, there's money for training, um, there's uh, the health and wellness initiatives, the, the trauma-informed counseling services that we're, we're able to deliver, the employee assistance programs that we've been able to initiate, all those are tremendously important and uh, we've been able to do. Um, with regard to, the, I, I just have to say that um, uh, with regard to um, reopening the campus, uh, we, the equipment, operational planning, all those kinds of things, we're ready. 
staffing is the biggest issue. We are we are 400 and, and, and around 440, 450 officers below where we need to be to be able to, to um, uh, uh, do the workload that, that we that we have responsibility for. And it gets to the threats against Congress. Um, you know, we, we're the, we are investing, uh, investigating the threats against Congress, but I will tell you, we're barely keeping our head above water in, for those investigations. We've, we've been able to put, you know, the um, regional offices have, have uh, been able to help a little bit. But the fact of the matter is that we're going to have to nearly double the number of agents that work those um, uh, threat cases. Uh, we've increased the number over the last couple of years by necessity, but even now, it needs to be increased even more. So uh, that's, you know, in their FY22, FY23 budget, you're going to see uh, additional uh, positions being requested, whether it's for dignitary protection capability or, or investigating threats and all the other places where our workload has, has increased dramatically. So um, we've got, look, we've got a ways to go before we could reopen the campus. Um, but we're working toward that. And if I'm able to uh, get up 288 new recruits on board this year, uh, um, it'll get us a long way toward being able to uh, staff the posts that we need to staff to be able to open back up. But we need some time. Mr. Chairman, if I can just ask General Walker to comment sure. on the in-district piece. But I just want to say to Chief Manger, um, um that with the, with the team here, if you can't really get to us, get to the chair and to the ranking member, the, specifically the way you pointed out the staffing, what's needed, what, what is there, what are the resources that are necessary in order for us to do keep our head above water um, on, uh, on, on the threats and how we reopen this campus, because it is going to be reopened and there will be many, 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 many more people here and we need to be prepared for that. Uh, yeah. So that document will be critically important. General Walker, if you can just address the security enhancement for members and staff in districts. Um, and I know you've talked about the training for the uh, law enforcement coordinators and what kind yeah. of funding do we need? If you can just yes, get that. I, I think we need robust funding in a best case scenario in a perfect world. Each district would have two district law enforcement coordinators. In my opinion, both of them, both of them should be well versed in law enforcement, a retired or former law enforcement officer, a law enforcement officer with 5 to 10 years, the ability to qualify for HR 218 that would allow he, he, uh, um, an officer man or woman to be able to carry a weapon. Who knows about uh, protection who, who can understand um, making assessments of an event that a member is going to attend. So I would double the member, uh, I would double the district law enforcement coordinators and have them travel statewide, have authority to carry a weapon statewide. But regarding your residences, I think we should pour money into securing residents, lighting uh, that would come on motion sensors, motion detectors, um, video uh, doorbells, video equipment inside and out, that would, um, and then uh, relationships that under, so we'd understand what are the threats in a community. Even a, a new member, wh where do you live? How many calls for service do the police respond to? And what types of calls, burglaries, robberies, thefts, uh, homicides? We need to understand where our members live and what level of protection they need to be afforded. So, so we do need to throw funding at protecting members. Thank you for the question, ma'am. For the indulgence of the chair, ranking member, and the, the members of the committee for going over time. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Representative Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues that are our deep gratitude uh, to the Capitol Police, to the Sergeant at Arms, and to the architect of the Capitol and their staffs for um, not only um, uh, the protections on January 6th, but how you are working to meet the ongoing threat environment that we are in. We are deeply grateful. 
Um, Chief Manger, I wanted to go back to talking about the almost, I think it's 447 officers that you are short. Um, is there, um, are there themes that, that we can be helpful with that are merging in problems and recruiting and training? And I specifically want to know if the salary disparity between Capitol Police and other federal law enforcement agencies is playing a role. So I guess the short answer is we've got, with, with the staffing needs that we have, we've got to give ourselves every advantage in terms of hiring. And um, the, uh, so I, I and I, I will confess that I, I don't know that if, how competitive our salaries are, but I know that with the retention bonus, the hazard pay, the specialty pays that we've been able to give the specialty units, um, all help us in terms of recruiting and retaining uh, good officers. Um, the, uh, so um, I, I, I think that um, we need to uh, look at, you have, and we can have folks uh, do a study in terms of uh, comparing our salary and benefits compared to other law enforcement agencies that we compete with. And if we need to make adjustments, uh, I'll be the first one to let you know. Oh, great. And can you can you tell me a little bit about the strategies that you have found to be most effective in addressing the trauma and stress and burnout within the force so we can work on improving our retention? Yes, ma'am. Um, so in terms of, of uh, for, for police officers, and I guess you could really say this for any occupation, you, you have really two goals with with those kinds of initiatives. First is helping employees with to cope with the daily stress of the job. The second goal is to help employees that through crises. That is when they're involved in traumatic events, um, provide them with trained counselors uh, uh, to help try and build the resiliency. So you've got the daily stress, you've got the traumatic incidents. And we have put together, um, I, I think, initiatives um, we're contracting with the Center for Mind-Body uh, Medicine. We've stood up our own health and wellness center, the Howie Lieben Good Center for Wellness. Um, we've got employee assistance, health, nutrition, trauma-informed care specialists, peer support program, support dog program, three fitness centers, and a chaplain program. So we're trying to really have wraparound services for um, whatever our cops need. For the protection of our force and those they serve, can you tell me what systems you have put in place to try and root out any dangerous or extremist groups that um, may have infiltrated our force? So I, I think it, it, it all begins with the hiring process and you've got to make sure that the background investigations that we do, the polygraph uh, tests that we give, um, the, the uh, uh, the deep dive into an individual social media, um, but you know, the social media um, uh, is also tremendously important to really uh, uh, to determine is this person suitable to be a police officer, um, and then so it, it, that's that's where it starts. But I think that um, as as after you hire someone, you do need to ensure that you um, have. Uh, the, the kind of checks that are necessary to make sure that there's not something that has changed in terms of their background. And um, with uh, right after January 6th, as, as I'm sure you're aware, there were probably uh, at least 30 cases where there were complaints against officers that questioned um, their actions during January 6th. And were they uh, somehow assisting the the um, uh, folks that had uh, uh, that had broken into the Capitol, the groups there, um, and uh, most of those cases were handled before I got here. But I actually have handled I think three of them since I've been here. And we there's one officer who um, we determined in fact um, had uh, his actions um, weren't were not in, consistent with um, the department's mission, and that officer is no longer here. Um, another officer, uh, you know, made a mistake, but he was not in cahoots, so to speak, with with the uh, uh, with the protesters, with the rioters. Um, the third uh, uh, case, I think, was what the officer was exonerated. So, you know, having in depth, uh, having really uh, good in depth investigations to determine if an officer um, is involved or engaged in some kind of activity that would uh, l lead to a question about their 
um, loyalty to our mission. Uh, that's important uh, as well to make sure that those investigations are done thoroughly and, uh, and, and uh, decisive action is taken on those cases. Thank you so much, Chief. Mr. Chairman, I've forgotten how quickly five minutes goes by, so maybe a second round. <laughs> yes, for sure. Chairman uh, and, and Ms. Clark, can I just add to that? Sure. So, so the House Sergeant at Arms is, uh, has developed an insider threat awareness program to uncover insider threats and, and employees who, who do lose their compass. And, and that will be briefed to the Capitol Police Board. If not this month, the next board meeting in February, and we're gonna work collaboratively to hang these briefings. And, and the goal, the strategic objective is to have people in the United States, police officers trained as insider threat specialists. So we recognize the signs and symptoms, the indicators of someone whose allegiance has changed. Part two of that is to the, is the try to introduce some kind of security clearance for U.S. Capitol Police officers. The thing with a security clearance, as you all well know, they expire. So you have to have this periodic reinvestigation. Has your allegiance changed? Do you have close and continuous contact with, with groups that are nefarious, your foreign travel, on duty or off, that needs to be reported. Who are you associating with? So I'll leave it there, uh, not to take too much time, but I just wanted to let you know, um, Representative Clark and, and others, that the Sergeant at Arms has a, a partner with the intelligence community and the Homeland Security um, agencies to create a role, and the FBI, to create this robust um, insider threat program. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, uh, Chief, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Amade. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. It's nice to see you again. It's been quite a while. I trust you've been doing okay without daily kind of support from me, so we'll just get on to this topic of the hearing, okay? Sounds good. Okay. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try to make it without you. Okay. Way to tough it out. Um, um, I, I want to join in um, in uh, Congresswoman Herrera Butler's thing about, you know, it, it'd be nice just to have kind of the general accounting info folks, uh, especially general in chief, um, about burn rates of the money that, that, that you've gotten so far. And, and the only reason I say that is it, it, to be intelligent about what you need to continue down the road and stuff like that, it would it would be kind of nice as as an appropriator and in an oversight capacity to be able to say that we followed up on just what was done with with sup, the supplemental so far, obviously, as well as the stuff going forward. So I'd like to join in that request and, and, and we'll circle back with you folks um, offline, not, not on the committee's time to see if we can, you know, if, if there's some security aspects, that's fine. We can get a briefing or whatever but but i do think that's kind of a fundamental thing as we sit here a year after the fact and say okay what have we learned and what have we started to do um uh, Ch chief let me ask you just a, a, a real quick question when you talk about personnel and and needing all these folks um remind me how long it takes to identify train whatever from when you decide i'm gonna hire tim ryan to be on the capitol police to when tim ryan actually shows up for his first day of work. That's not something where you turn it off and on or a 30, 60 day thing. I don't recall, but you tell me, how long does it take from uh, from completing what you have to do from recruitment to background, to training, to they're on the job? The better part of a year. Uh, okay. from, the, from the time we, we focus in on hiring somebody to the time we can actually put them out by themselves, they're finished with training and they're, they, can, they can go to a post or go to an assignment by themselves, better part of a year. So that's an important thing in terms of our expectations. If we fix all the appropriation problems next week, we're still in 2023, basically, uh, before we start thinking about fully staffed in a perfect world. So, um, and, and someone asked earlier, and, I, and now that you've reminded me, I didn't answer this part of the question. We do have other strategies to uh, try and get, um, to ease some of the staffing issues. Um, we're looking at re rehiring um, annuitants, retirees, bringing them back. 
Um, we're looking at, at hiring lateral positions. So we, you know, we can look to other uh, federal law enforcement agencies and, and, you know, allow people to come over and join our agency. Um, we, and plus the uh, use of contract security um, that uh, General Walker talked about. And so um, these would all be um, short-term strategies to allow us to um, get us over the, uh, to, to a point where um, we can relieve some of the staffing hardships that we're experiencing today uh, for our officers. And then as, as, as we, you know, if we are able to hire 280 officers a year over the next couple of years, that's going to get us ahead of attrition and put us where we need to be. Okay. Um, and, and so you're thinking outside of the box, but nonetheless, it's like, hey, this is going to, and, and good. Um, I, I, I want to let you know that, that I'm going to be requesting a chance to come sit down with you since I haven't had a chance since you came on board to talk about uh, some of the other things you've talked about in your, in your testimony, as well as the general. But I want to alert both of you to something that, that I think is an ongoing problem since I've been affiliated with the committee, and, and that's actually the office buildings, and, and I, I don't know anything about the Senate ones, obviously. I try to stay away from those. But no, nonetheless, I, I will just tell you, I think the screening culture needs to change. I hope that the analysis that the architect of the Capitol is doing, as well as you guys on the Capitol Police Board, um, bring a new analysis into that. As I look at, we've kind of done what we've always done, and you look at that when you talk about when the, when the uh, sergeant at arms talks about knowing who's in your neighborhood and stuff like that, when I look at what goes on to come into the three buildings that I'm familiar with, and it's like, you know what? It's a pretty cold day out today, so you got people lined out the door. Um, you, you got the same sort of thing where you're going through the metal detectors and whatever, and it's like, I see no attempt, maybe I'm wrong, but I'll meet with you guys, to say, hey, how can we do a better job of this? And we don't got people out there sweating in July and freezing in January. And how are we actually screening them? I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that the sergeant at arms wants to use technology maybe to have a better idea who's coming and going. But I got to tell you, some of the spaces, and this is not this is not rank and file, this is leadership, where, where you've got a space the size of a closet for one of the cannon entrances, while you've got another entrance that's more spacious that's not being used because, well, I don't know, um, is something where I, I think we can do better. And, and I think with the change in leadership, we probably ought to take a look at that. And, and I know someday in the future, somebody's going to build a Capitol Visitor Center over here in a parking lot somewhere. But quite frankly, I don't think that's imminent. Um, and so the last thing I'll leave you with, and this is for the, uh, the general, we've been asking for an update on what we can do to screen people before they go in to vote for the metal detectors without making it look like an adjunct operation of the airport. And, and, we're, and I anxiously await that almost a year later in terms of the update. We want to screen people for, for metal before they go vote. That's fine with me. But we ought to be able to do it in a way where it doesn't look like it's Toledo International and, and a TSA operation. And I have been told before that the technology exists to do that. And, and so I'm really looking forward to an update on, on how we're going to uh, restore a little bit of decorum to just the act of walking into the chambers and, and making sure that nobody's carrying. So I look forward to all that stuff offline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Alverday. The Chief, do anybody want to comment on the gentleman from Nevada's comments? Don't have to. Ryan, I, I, I will uh, share with you that I have met with the Secret Service. They've come over and they've done an assessment. The technology does exist and we're working on it. That would be something we would need funding for. Uh, but but the, and and we'd have to work with the architect of the Capitol to have something that is less intrusive, but protect the structure. So so we are we're working aggressively on that uh, as we speak to speed up the process, get less like a airport terminal, but at the same time, ensure that nobody is bringing a prohibited item onto the floor. Well, and, and, and Mr. Chairman, if I might, and, and General, I look, I look forward to your brand of aggression in the coming year, as opposed to the aggression in the past year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
Uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Espea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your, your input today. Uh, I've expressed uh, in the past concerns about what uh, may be our, our next attack. Uh, I feel very strongly that it won't be the same way we were attacked during uh, January 6th, that it may have a different uh, sort of like approach. And as such, I, I've expressed my uh, concerns about uh, bomb sweeps. Uh, as you know, there was uh, two bombs placed uh, in the DNC and the RNC and uh, they were placed there and it just sort of like distracted uh, law enforcement away from the epicenter of the insurrection. And I just wanted to know, has any uh, measure been taken to increase the canine unit training and sweeps around the Capitol complex uh, and the perimeter around the Capitol complex to ensure that we are not uh, attacked in that form, in that fashion. Uh, in addition to that, any potential drone attacks uh, may be uh, something that we ought to prevent against. And I wanted to know if any uh, measures have been taken uh, regarding uh, these two methods that could be used by uh, insurrectionists in the future. Uh, yes, sir. Chief Manger here. Um, I, yes to all your, all of your questions. Um, we um, uh, have uh, put together a better procedure to do what we call foundation checks um, around all of the buildings. Um, we are, I just got um, numbers uh, uh, in the last day or two about the number of um, sweeps that we have done for, uh, that our canines have done around the buildings over the past year thousands and thousands of sweeps um, and we're looking at the number of canines that we have and are looking to increase them over the next year or two just so we can ensure that we uh, do an adequate number of sweeps um, multiple a day if need be uh, to ensure the safety of, uh, of our campus from, from explosives. Besides the sweeps that are conducted to vehicles entering the Capitol are there, do you have uh, you increased the canine unit since uh, January 6? Has there been? Uh, any yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't know the answer, and I'll get back to you with the answer if we have increased. But I know that we're looking over the next year or two to increase the number of canines that we have. And, and uh, but we're also uh, looking at um, and, and working with the Capitol Police Board um, with the uh, with regard to the issue of drones. Okay, but nothing has uh, actually occurred regarding these two, uh, the drone piece and, and uh, the increase of canine. No, well, th we have increased the number of sweeps that we do with canines. Uh, that has dramatically increased, and it's not just the, the vehicles coming in. It's also the, the uh, around all the buildings. Um, and there, there has been work done, um, and we're looking, we're working with contractors um, to make sure that we have the ability to counter any um, drones that uh, come into our airspace. So the wor that work is is underway. Okay. My uh, second question is uh, regarding the uh, construction reinforcements to the exterior and interior doors and camera systems and window replacement throughout the campus. What has occurred there? Has there been a, a, a an improvement, uh, re, uh, reinforcements to the exterior doors, interior doors, the camera systems, and window replacements in the campus? So I'll start out with the, this is uh, Brett Bland, the architect. I'll start out with, with the interior doors. We have, um, we have, prior to being informed by the security assessment, we have uh, installed in leadership offices, uh, people so they can see outside and breach resistant hinges to reduce the ability for people to get inside on, on the doors. In in the um, the chamber, we have increased security of doors there. I, unfortunately, the, the the projects themselves are classified, and I'm willing to take have an offline discussion where we can go into more detail. I will say it, 
a, a good security project. From my perspective, when it comes to the, like a chamber is something that you don't even know it's there. And um, I would willing to walk you and show you what we've done. So you can see, wow, this this looks like it was like the door was there before, but it's a different door. What about cameras? Uh, so the cameras are under the purview of the, the Capitol Police. We install the physical infrastructure form and the, with the Capitol Police determine where a camera needs to be placed and um, and how many they need to be. So I, I will uh, uh, pass that over to the chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman from uh, New York, the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Newhouse. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I want to uh, thank all three of our uh, witnesses today. Thank you for being here and uh, thank you for your service as well as pl please uh, relay my appreciation to everyone that you work with for, for their service to us as well. Um, I want to ask all three of you my questions and then I'll turn uh, the floor back over to you for your responses. But <clears throat> first of all, uh, Chief Manger, um, as was, I think, to be expected in the months following January 6th of last year, morale at the U.S. Capitol Police was was low. Um, as you alluded to, rank and file officers demonstrated they had little or no faith in the capability of, of police leadership. Um, what, like your estimation, you've already addressed your, your uh, level of faith in your current leadership, and I appreciate that. Uh, like, would like your estimation of the level of faith that you believe that the police officers on the ground have in the leadership of the organization at this time. And then secondly, I wanted to uh, talk, ask you a little bit about the U.S. Capitol Police Memorial Fund that was established, I think, in 98 uh, after the tragic loss of two individuals who defended the Capitol from a lone gunman and then was, I believe, expanded in, uh, after the congressional baseball shooting in 2017. My understanding is that um, many, uh, what, what we have 140 plus police officers injured on January 6th. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to ask about the level of distribution to some of the families and to the individuals uh, in the amounts that may have been given to individual police officers uh, as a result of January 6th. Uh, then for General Walker, and I appreciate being able to visit with you earlier this week and get to know you a little bit. We look forward to working with you over the coming months as we work on these important issues. But I wanted to talk to you, as I intimated earlier, about the opening of the Capitol campus. And I know there's been some discussion about that. Um, if you could talk about any conversations you've had related to that, what metrics or plans that been able to establish for that eventual reopening? Um, and is there any um, uh, coordination, I guess, between the House and Senate? They, they seem to have a different a different set of metrics. It, seem, it seems things are more open on the Senate side, and I just wanted to know about some of the uh, differences and, and the reasons for those and what we can look forward to in the future. I know this is a big interest of, of uh, a lot of members and certainly want to keep uh, staff and members safe at the same time, but we do want to open up to the people's house back to the people. And then for uh, Mr. Blanton, uh, the AOC, um, you stated a year ago, and I appreciate you coming back to meet with us this year, but uh, about the fact that you were uh, uh, never contacted about the possibility of deploying the National Guard to help secure the Capitol ahead, ahead of January 6th. And obviously that's a big part of your responsibility, which, you know, the operation and preservation of the, of the complex. Uh, you're a member of the Capitol Police Board. Um, so are you, do you feel that you're engaged in the board's decision-making process? And, and do you have voting power? Do you feel, I want to ask you if you feel that in the last year, communication among the members of the police board has improved. And if not, uh, how would you suggest that it could be improved in order to prevent uh, uh, the kind of issues that we saw from happening into the future? So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll start with uh, 
uh, Chief Manger, and I appreciate your responses. Yes, sir. Um, so in terms of the morale from the officer's perspective, I, I understand fully um, after January 6th why the confidence um, of the officers, the confidence in the department, their confidence in the leadership of this department um, was was not very good. Um, and that's an understatement. Uh, they, they believe that the department let them down, uh, that, that, that the department's lack of operational planning resulted in injuries, um, deaths, um, and, uh, and I know that a fair number of officers still to this day are not satisfied that um, uh, there's been accountability. Um, I, I would, would again point out the fact that um, the, the following day, the chief, the sergeant, the, both sergeant of arms were, were no longer in their positions. Um, and, and all the other leadership that has left the department since then. So, but I do understand from the officer's perspective, and, and, but it was, it's not universally um, bad morale, you know, uh, or, or uh, you know, in our department. There's a lot of officers that do enjoy working here, who come to work and believe in their mission and believe that they're doing good work and, and doing important work every day. Again, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag in terms of, of uh, the officer's perspective. With regard to the memorial fund, um, we uh, th there's there's good news with the memorial fund. We have just and I know it's taken a long time, but we have now got a draft um, form in place so that officers who want to apply for money from the memorial fund and we've got a policy in place. Uh, it's going to go out to the union here shortly for their input, um, but it's it's finally in place and and so that we can move forward with officers actually applying for money. It, since January 6th, uh, there's only been two officers that have received money from the Memorial Fund. Both of those officers um, were uh, were killed in the line of duty and their family received money. We, it's, uh, we typically um, uh, keep confidential who gets it and how much they get, but I will say that two officers um, have received uh, uh, money from the Memorial Fund and that the maximum that um, uh, that any family can get um, is two hundred thousand dollars, and and if I and and Mr. Newhouse, um, if I could just, uh, I know you didn't ask me this question, but with regard to the National Guard, I so appreciate the um, uh, what uh, the Congress did in terms of giving me the authority to make that call. But let me stress that um, you know that I uh, I've spoken with two or three previous, uh, actually three or four previous. Capitol Police Chiefs um, about their relationship with the uh, Capitol Police Board, and uh, many of them expressed their um, uh, view that, that it was a very dysfunctional relationship. I've not had that experience at all. Um, I, I get great cooperation and uh, with from the Capitol Police Board, and frankly, I think now, you know, Mr. Blanton's been around for a while, but you've got two new sergeant at arms, a new police chief, and we are working together as a as a team with one mission in mind, and that's to make this campus uh, as safe as it can be. So, for what it's worth, that's my opinion. Thank you, General Walt Walker. Yes, Representative Newhouse. Thank you for the question. So, we would be ready. We have a plan to reopen the Capitol. The challenge is. Um, Everything we're hearing from Admiral uh, Monahan tells us that opening the Capitol is not safe right now. That it is, um, we're focused on security right now because of the rising number of COVID infections. So I've had uh, three of my people come down last week with COVID. And here's here's what what's frightening about this: they've had both uh, vaccinations and they were boosted. So and he had the booster and uh, chief major can tell you the number and I apologize. I don't remember the actual number of officers down because of COVID. So I think we would put an undue burden on the United States Capitol police to have them uh, um, be, be uh, in a challenge of in a COVID environment with an open with an open. Um, um, uh, an open complex where people are walking around, some with masks, some without masks. Uh, 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 Representative Newhouse, I see people, uh, members, staff, without masks. And, um, you know, I, 
I'll, I'll walk up to them and I'll ask them to put the mask on and some just walk away from me, some put it on. So um, I, I think if we open this, the people's house, which will be opened, but I'm hoping it's open once Dr. Ma Admiral Monaghan gives us the green light to, to open it. So we're leaning heavily on what uh, Admiral Monaghan is telling us regarding this pandemic, this epidemic that we're facing right now. I, I, I thank you for the question. I hope I hope that answered it. That's helpful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blanton. Yes, thank you, uh, Representative. Uh, I will say unequivocally that this is a completely different board than we had on January 5th. Not just in people, but I'm talking about in, in its functionality, its unity, and its in, in engagement across. Um, this, the, the leadership changes have been significant, and I can tell you uh, we are much, in a much better place. Okay, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Clark is right. Five minutes is shorter than it used to be. So thank you. And seven minutes is shorter than you think, too. <laughs> uh, Ms. Wexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses coming before us today and coming to testify and sharing sharing your stories and what you've been doing. Um, you know, I, I'm the last person to ask questions in this, in the, at least at least in the first round, and so I have the benefit of everybody else having asked their questions. Um, so that's good. Although they asked a lot of the same questions I was going to ask, but there's been a lot of discussion about morale, and um, and and Chief uh, Chief Manger, you you said that that officers believe that the United States Capitol Police you know, let them down and did not have the operational security to to take care of them and to protect them on, on Jan January 6th. And the reason they believe that is because the USCP did let, let them down. And so, you know, that's something that they have, they have had to deal with since that time. But I very much appreciate the, the changes that you've made and what you're doing to show that, that you know, that you're going to not just talk the talk, but you're going to walk the walk. And that the proof's in the pudding and, and, you know, show me, don't tell me. So I appreciate that very much, everything that you've done for that. And related to that, I want to thank everybody for, for, for standing up the Howie Deep and Good uh, Center for Wellness, making that a reality, because that is going to be so helpful for these officers. And I also want to thank you, because as, as mo most of you know, Howie was a constituent of mine, gotten to know his family pretty well, and they're so, so pleased and gratified that, that hopefully no other Capitol Police family will have to go through what they did. I want to thank you for that, and I'm glad it will be open soon. And I look forward to coming to the ribbon cutting with you, hopefully in better times when we're able to do that. I also want to thank uh, the Capitol Police and Sergeant at Arms Office for having that chamber training. I actually participated in it. I know a number of folks did. Probably a lot of members didn't, but I'm really glad I did. And I also want to thank you very much, uh, and probably on behalf of myself and, and Ms. Herrera Butler as well, for actually putting hair ties in the uh, in the escape hoods so that we can put our hair up and actually and actually get a tight seal because um, that's something that a lot of people don't think about but i want to thank you guys for that it was very informative i don't i hope i hope and pray that we'll never need to use it again but but it's good to have that information there um so about recruitment and retaining um, new officers within the united states capitol police workforce one of the things that we had been talking about was one of the issues that we faced with with them is that is that they don't get their uh, their their pension based upon their overtime pay rates, and I know that uh, many many officers have have been have been working a lot of overtime. It's been it's been it's been an issue for many years. It's probably even still more of an issue. So I guess my first question for you is: Has there been any discussion about making that 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 change to the pensions? And then also um, also what is the status of overtime for FY22 thus far? So um, there has been discussion about um, including uh, uh, overtime in the retirement calculations. Uh, I can tell you that um, uh, in my uh, years of experience, I've seen departments do that and then decide that it wasn't sustainable. Um, so I think that uh, I, I've seen uh, how it manifests itself in terms of, um, you know, uh, senior officers who you know, some who never worked overtime before, but in their last couple of years, they're working all the overtime they can um, and how it impacts um, uh, other people's ability to, to work overtime. Uh, 
So as long as we work through those issues so that it, it's something that's sustainable and it can work, I think we can find uh, some way to, um, uh, to benefit our officers by including some of that overtime in terms of the retirement calculation. Um, and, and now I've, I've, I've lost track of, the, of your second question. I'm sorry. So overtime, overtime for FY22. Yes. Is it, is, yeah. it, is, it, is, it, is it higher than in FY21? Or, it's, or it's, it's maintaining. I mean, we just, we still have the staffing issues. I was talking to an officer last night um, who had been held over um, from the previous shift because we didn't have, and this is, this is more with the spike of COVID. Um, as, as General Walker mentioned, I mean, we've got, I think now close to, uh, it's well over 100 and almost maybe even 200 officers that are uh, out because of COVID. And, and, you know, they may just be out for the isolation period. We've got so, a number of officers who are out long term because of COVID, um, but it's it's really impacting us. So, yes, our, our overtime is going to be every, so far as every bit as bad at FY22 as it was in 21. And what is the United States Capitol Police? What is what is the Capitol Police policy for for quarantining with COVID right, after a positive test? Um, we we're, we abide by what um, the officer the office of the attending physician tells us, and that, that just changed from if you're asymptomatic. I, and I, I shouldn't speak for the attending physician, but um, my my recollection was if you're asymptomatic, that it's gone from ten days to five days of isolation. And you testified that you have some contract laborers, um, contract security that you're using. How many how many contract security officers are you using, and and how how long do you anticipate having to keep them on? Uh, on well, on right now at zero, we're trying to get um, around forty or fifty on board. We still have to brief. Uh, we're we're briefing oversight committees. We're still. Uh, uh, discussing with the union. They have some concerns about it. We're still discussing with the union their concerns to, and we want to address their concerns, but we're ready to, um, to get this done. We uh, hopefully in a matter of a, of a few weeks, start getting uh, some contract folks in to, to give us some relief in terms of our staffing. And then you also testified that every, every Capitol police officer now has a cell phone. That wasn't the case before. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and they're getting uh, intelligence and operational updates every day. And are they getting those by cell phone or are they getting them in roll call or how are they, how are they, how are you deploying those, those, um, those briefings? That, you know, with COVID, we, our roll calls are less um, formal than they have been in the past. Uh, so we, we really rely on the cell phones to ensure that officers are getting information, but we do, we do in fact do in-person updates, um, uh, on a regular basis as well. And is, are those the ones that go out to their cell phones? Those aren't classified, are they? They're law enforcement sensitive, but okay. not classified. Very good. And then in, in one of the, um, in one of the, again, I don't know if it was in your testimony or in, in the memo, there was a discussion of, of member protection based on uh, a risk matrix. Is that correct? That you make a determination based on the risk to the member? Correct. Yes. And and is that is that a proactive or a reactive risk matrix? Is it based upon uh, on previous threats, or is it based upon uh, possibility of threats due to there being you know a, a high profile individual? It's more reactive, but um, we certainly um, understand that. I mean, we we keep track of the number of threats that each member gets, and uh, we're certainly cognizant of that, and and um, do what we can to try and prevent future threats or um, provide some uh, advice and, and and some strategies for um, those uh, members that have a, a high number of threats, how they can maintain a better level of security. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, I see that I have also over, over, overstayed my welcome and, and used uh, too much time. So I'll, I'll yield back with that. I uh, thank the gentlelady. I got a couple of questions. We are going to do a second round uh, for those members who, who want to stick around and, and ask uh, another question. A general uh, talked uh, about uh, really threats to members. How many threats have there been in the, in the past year or so to members of Congress? And, and how does that relate to a normal year? So, so I, I believe uh, the information I received from the U.S. Capitol Police that there was almost nine thousand, so double the number 
that it was last year. So uh, if not 9,000, approaching 9,000 threats. Now those threats come in a whole um, a variety of threats, you know, in, you know, menacing or, or, or just uh, somebody saying something reckless on the internet or social media. But but the number I think I had from from the chief was close to nine thousand. And you say there's no there's no uh, law that would allow for a prosecution of a threat to a member of Congress. I mean, specifically to a member of Congress, it would have to be more a, g a general prosecution. Yes, sir, uh, Chairman Ryan. Right now, the threat has to be investigated. It it needs to. Does the person have the capability uh, to to act on the threat? Is it someone just talking? Is it um, diminished mental capacity? Someone just uh, getting out there saying something, and that individual's in a wheelchair in a, a nursing home can't really do it, but it's just uh, uh, making a veil a, a threat. So we have to investigate the threat. The Capitol Police has to investigate the threat and then determine uh, does this person have the means and capability and motive to act on the threat. And once that's determined, sometimes the prosecution, state, local, federal, is not following through on bringing these people to justice. That's where I think more emphasis needs to be uh, leveraged to, to make sure that if the Capitol Police believe that they have sufficient evidence to go to an assistant U.S. attorney or a state's attorney, then it needs to be prosecuted. And I think that's uh, that would be therapeutic. Do you think that needs to be, to your recommendation, uh, more uh, weight behind that? So an additional uh, law that would be specific to members of Congress that the U.S. attorney would be able to then utilize in the prosecution? Or do you think that the current legal regime is enough to, to kind of put the emphasis out there, do the prosecution as a, as a way to prevent future threats? Well, I, I think both uh, Chairman Ryan, I think if we could strengthen the laws that currently exist. So if you make a threat against the president, that's a bucket right there, a threat against the president or anyone of the successors to the president. I believe I understand it that way. I know it's the president, the vice president, and then the line of succession. If, if members of Congress could somehow be elevated to have that kind of status, I believe that would go a long way in stopping these uh, uh, individuals from making these rec reckless threats, somebody is eventually going to act on it, and it, it could be a tragedy if we if we don't do something about it. So, 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 Chairman Ryan, I think any time we can strengthen the laws that protect members, I think we should go after that. I, I appreciate that. I mean, we those of us on this committee feel a. Uh, a deep sense of responsibility to our colleagues, uh, knowing that the 9,000 threats that are out there and the lack of funding, which is why you know we saw a significant increase in a lot of the security measures and the appropriations in the supplemental from the House version, really tried to address a lot of these issues. Uh, and you mentioned you know uh, having robust security at members' homes, assessing the neighborhoods they live in and what the threats would be from, you know, generally. Um, and so I, I appreciate you, you know, speaking up on that. Uh, again, there, there's some uh, allowance through our campaign committees to be able to provide home, some level of home security. Uh, but I don't think people are out there sending us 10 bucks or 15 bucks or 20 bucks for our reelection that really would want us to use that money uh, to, or home security system. Um, you know, this is these threats are because of our official capacity, the official duties that we hold. And so I appreciate you speaking up on that because it's very, very frustrating uh, that, you know, we're not allowed to do these kinds of things to, you know, protect ourselves and our families when we're many instances away from home, but our families are still there. <laughs> and so, uh, it, you know, doesn't doesn't make for a, a good environment. Uh, so I appreciate it, uh, General. I, quickly, Chief. Um, Can I add just one thing? Sure. I, I also think, uh, since you're talking about law, I think it would be helpful if the United States Capitol Police Investigative Division could be given concurrent jurisdiction 
to have this, the FBI right now investigates threats against members and they investigate threats against all uh, federal employees. But what is the priority? If the United States Capitol Police, and I'm just thinking of this right now, is giving concurrent jurisdiction, the same authorities that the FBI has to go after um, uh, uh, people who make these threats. Uh, the Postal Inspection Service, I happen to know for a fact that they have concurrent ju jurisdiction to go after postal employees, uh, separate from what the FBI does. Uh, I'm sorry, I just felt compelled to add that, sir. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, quickly, Chief, um, you have any thoughts on on this with regard to member security that you want to add? Uh, just a couple of things. One, um, I I. I uh, I agree with the uh, general that um, the Capitol Police, and, and I'm not sure that we, I, I don't know, and, and perhaps the general does, I'm not sure we don't have concurrent jurisdiction, but I think we should make an affirmative statement that that it is a shared responsibility because I don't want there to be any, um, uh, any turf battles in terms of um, investigating those threats against Congress. We have more... Uh, we, I think, have the primary interest in terms of investigating those cases, and and so, you know, working with FBI is good. But we 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 would we may take a case that the FBI says no, it doesn't rise to the level of something we would investigate, whereas we would take it and investigate. So, um, the the other thing is that um, I have uh, uh, since I've been here, I have reached out to local law enforcement in home districts of. Uh, uh, members of Congress, and I have had 100% cooperation. And I know that uh, I may get to a point where I don't, you know, get a chief or sheriff that doesn't want to cooperate. But so far, I've had 100% cooperation from the state and local authorities in terms of getting the assistance that we've uh, we've requested uh, with regard to uh, either a member's home, their family, uh, safety and security issues. So um, I, I, we, we will continue to, to be that advocate for the members, um, if they are having difficulty getting the assistance that they need in their local jurisdictions, uh, if they come to us, we'll certainly be an advocate for them to try and get uh, uh, get what they they need in terms of making sure their families are safe and secure as well. And and uh, chief, so there, there's obviously a lot of chatter on the internet. You know, a lot of a lot of stuff that's that's you know kind of public. I think after the sixth, a lot of these groups. Uh, are trying to figure out how to be more behind the scenes uh, with some of their uh, plans, some of their views and all the rest. Um, is there anything that we're doing proactively, at least that we could talk about in the public setting here uh, that you're, you're trying to address as members are walking around? Maybe there's nothing on Facebook. Maybe there's nothing on Twitter. No one says something threatening, uh, but there may be a threat out in the community somewhere. Is there some strategy for us to uh, have that connection with maybe local law enforcement or in other ways of trying to figure that out? Yes. Um, and I, and you're, you're uh, astute in, in, uh, in your thought that we, we, I don't want to give you our strategies, but what I will tell you is we have eight people, we've onboarded eight people as in intelligence analysts that are working with other intelligence agencies and will work with state and local uh, folks to share information um, that uh, with the whole purpose of keeping uh, our members and their families as safe as we can. Right. And uh, quickly on the trauma-informed care uh, center for mind-body medicine, I know we've we've beefed up uh, the House Office of Well-Being, which of course you you all uh, and your staffs will be able to access uh, the different programmings there. We got something with the David Lynch Foundation. We've got something with uh, a, a vets program, Project Welcome Home Troops, that really digs in on post-traumatic stress uh, with veteran uh, trauma, which is obviously the same as many of your rank and file members experienced uh, on January 6th. And we just want to constantly encourage the rank and file members to know that these programs are here, uh, that they're, they're very beneficial. I know you're talking about doing videos and things like that to let everybody know, you know, exactly how beneficial these, is, these are. And then the peer to peer support, which I think is going to be critical to have the rank and file members really peppered with people who know how to uh, work through some of these issues around self-care and trauma and all the rest. So really appreciate you uh, 
leaning in on this. It's it's going to be very important uh, for for us to be able to retain a lot of the members. Last question, and then we'll go to Ms. Herrera Butler. Um, the the issue of competition and, and recruiting. I'm hearing you know 288 or so uh, officers that you want to try to ramp up in the next year. Um, there's good competition here. I'm I'm just uh, you know, small town guy from Ohio, but, you know, being here in D.C., seeing what's going on in Southern Maryland and some of those departments, seeing what's going on in Northern Virginia, which has seen an explosion of growth over the last uh, 20 years. How, how are we able to compete uh, and can we compete with those departments here locally for, for the talent that we need? So we, um, we, we can compete and we are competing pretty well. Um, we've not had trouble getting people in the door to take the test and express interest in wanting to be a part of the U.S. Capitol Police. Our challenge, as I said earlier, is making sure we hire the right people. Um, and so uh, we, we've got uh, we've used the money that we got in the supplemental to expand our recruitment efforts. We've uh, partnered with um, different associations, law enforcement associations, uh, the women, uh, women leaders in law enforcement, um, other agencies that um, will help us uh, uh, not only do outreach to get the numbers of people, but to get a diverse group uh, of applicants as well. So we, we and, and we, we're going to have to bolster um, our our recruiting staff, our background investigators, because, you know, we're, we've got an ambitious goal to get 280 plus people in. Uh, so we're going to need uh, more recruiters, more background investigators. And, and we've, we've, we've got those requests in. Um, but I, I don't I think we're going to be able to do it. I mean, that's we're, we're going to work hard at it. We've partnered with a lot of folks. I think we can be competitive. And, and um, my I, I believe we can accomplish this goal. And our, our wages and benefits and retirement are competitive with those departments? They're competitive, but we, we don't want to be in the middle of the pack. We want to be uh, at the top of the heap so that um, we can uh, we have that advantage in terms of our uh, recruiting efforts. And uh, any place where I think we can bolster that, you'll be hearing from me so that we, um, we can make a decision about whether we want to change the compensation, the retirement uh, benefits, all those kinds of things. If we can make them better, we're going to uh, get the advantages we need in terms of our recruiting. And I'll, I'll uh, continue that conversation with you. Great. Appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Sarah Butler. I actually had a question for um, General Walker. Is Did he just <laughs> leave the... Uh, I, I wanted a clarification on his comments. Is that possible for... Is he completely gone? No, he, I think he's taken a comfort break. That's ah, cool. sorry. I was like, go grab it. He's leaving. Okay. Well, then I'll wait one yeah. second. I'll, it, when he comes back. Um, one uh, minute. <laughs> well, no, take his time. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, gosh, this might also be him. Uh, with regard to um, what the matrix, you know, risk matrix for, uh, you know, that was something we were talking earlier with regard to responding to threats. Uh, on on members, what is the risk matrix or the the co you know the standard procedure for deciding when or when not to put up the fence, or is that not something we're going to do again? And is that a General Walker question? I don't know, well, um, Chief. Yeah, ma'am. Um, I'm happy to to uh, give you a little bit of information. Yeah. Um, the I I think all of us, and as a Capitol Police Board, I know we've had these discussions. We're all aware of the. Um, the impacts when we decide to put up the fence. Um, we, we understand the impact it has on the community. Uh, many members don't like it. So um, we're going to be very uh, discerning um, in the, you know, moving forward about when we put it up. But um, I think one of the things that um, the architect has done that is just um, really uh, improves the situation is he can put that fence up within 24 hours uh, notice and as as you as you may have seen on September 18th, well, you probably didn't see it because we had it up and down with within uh, 24 hours to get it up, 24 hours to get it down um, on September 18th. So the architect has uh, things in place that we can uh, get the fence up and down uh, very quickly. We, we can I ask? Can I ask? I know you guys are so sensitive um, to what it means to put that up. Is there a matrix or a a standard list of things that have to tip 
for you to consider putting it up? Or is it a gut level decision that you make well, when that happens? Yeah, there, there, there are certainly um, criteria that we consider. Uh, I don't know that we have a, 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 a hard and fast matrix and say, okay, well, if this happens, this happens, this happens. But if we feel there's a potential for violence, if we feel there's a, that there's an intent from a, a, a group that to try and breach the Capitol, I mean, those are two things that um, we, we would say, you know, better in, in an abundance of caution, maybe we should put it up. Um, but one of the things that is different from the sixth is that uh, as we look, if we have um, uh, an event that we feel there is a potential for violence or we feel there is a potential for someone to try and breach the Capitol, um, the staffing that we're going to have around the Capitol mm -hmm. is going to be vastly different than what we had on January yeah. 6th. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, quickly, because um, I wanted to ask about uh, trying to hire more. Maybe we'll stay with you before I go back to <laughs> General Walker. Um, I. So what strategies are you guys considering when it comes to um, taking on officers who maybe are already trained? I was told that there was an impediment to allowing you to hire former Secret Service agents or or Homeland Security agents, you know, folks who we know are trained, possibly to a higher level than some folks um, in, a, in, in this environment. What What is preventing or broadening that recruitment pool? Or is there nothing? No, there, there is. Um, th th we, um, uh, we are, in fact, looking at hiring laterals, um, uh, lateral transfers in. We are looking at hiring retirees. Um, and it depends on if you if you hire a retiree to come in at um, at the level of a police officer, um, it may not be an issue when you look at what their uh, pension is plus what their salary is. But that's the issue. The pension plus the uh, salary can't be above a certain level. And so if you hire folks, you know, at, at mid levels or in leadership levels, you really are limiting yourself because of the um, uh, salary cap that, that we have to deal with. So they can't come in because they're used to a higher salary and we bump their pension and it messes up our budget. Correct. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, um, General Walker, I wanted to ask, because I wasn't clear. So is the House side of the Capitol not open because of security or is it because of COVID? Um, Representative Herrera Butler's because of COVID. So. Okay. I, I'm so responsible for security, and to me, COVID is a security risk that we're not going to take. The 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 okay. Old Monahan has made it clear to me that it is not safe to open the Capitol to every you know the COVID challenge is just too big. Okay, I wasn't clear if it was like a threat or a, a staff an officer you know issue, and that's why the House side isn't open. But it, it, because I had understood that it was COVID, so which is what you, I think you're saying. Um, how do you square? I get that and it makes sense to me. But how do you then square that with the fact that the Senate is open? Like, how do I answer my constituents who want to come for tours? Like, how do you how do you answer that? So, so it, just perception. You know, uh, uh, when people comprehend things, I, what I have comprehended from the attending physician is that it is not safe to bring people into the Capitol. It's, it's, it's no different than, um, go, it's just high risk to bring, to open up the Capitol to everyone that would have, would have COVID. So how do, how do we do the six distance, the six feet uh, spacing? How do we do all the other things that would come with, uh, uh, how do we enforce the mask? So right now it's, it's a federal law. You are to, to, uh, obey the directions of a flight attendant or or a crew member. So I have flown. I, I, I had six feet distance, and I had that mask on, and I never took it off. I, I'm afraid of COVID, to be honest with you. So uh, it, it, until he says different, we're going to follow the direction and the guidance, the guidance of the attending physician. And I really can't speak to why the Senate. Maybe they're listening to a different medical professional. I'm, I mean, it's one attending physician, and I know you don't make that decision. I just was trying to understand, um, like, just the disparity that we're trying to explain to constituents 
like the senators don't wear masks. They don't, they're not shut down. It's just, a, it's a challenge. So yes, I'll leave that one for the record. Yes, Thank you. I, I'll just add the, the number of, of my own staff here who, who have uh, one, one, one person went on vacation, came back with COVID and then we all had to be tested and some, we had members, uh, members of the, of the staff catch it and they were vaccinated. So it's just a risk that I don't think we need to take. All right, thank you, Ms. Herrera Butler. Uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to follow up uh, with some questions for General Walker. Um, I wondered if you could just go over briefly some of the information that you have shared about how the improvements you've made for the speed and accuracy of threats being disseminated, not only to um, members, but to their staff as well. And anything the, the chief or the architect had to add, I, I think that we saw a real breakdown in communication and would love to hear about what you've put in place to help with that. Yes, Representative Clark. So, so the House Sergeant at Arms has hired um, former uh, senior executive service level intelligence professionals from the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. intelligence community, and, and other agencies to help uh, get right to the heart of a of a threat. And we're working collaboratively with the Capitol Police and their intelligence division to best understand any kind of threat that could be facing the Capitol, the members, visitors, and staff. So it's really about acquiring the, the talent. But you've also made cell phones available to- no, The Capitol Police has done that. The United States yeah. United States has given every police officer cell phones. So it's rapid of information. Could you talk about that a little bit, how those lines of communication have been improved? Um, you know, one of the biggest intelligence failures um, on the 6th was the fact that we had intelligence, but didn't disseminate it to our own people. And so the, the, one of the quick fixes um, that was put in place very quickly after the 6th was to ensure that our officers each had a cell phone. And now every day they get updates, intelligence update, updates and operational updates from their phone. In fact, some of my cops tell me it's sometimes almost too much information. <laughs> Obviously would rather have them too much than not enough. Um, uh, the, the other um, uh, shortcoming, and, and again, this has been fixed by the fact that we've got um, you know, new intelligence analysts and more intelligence analysts that were doing a better job at sharing information, um, you know, within the intelligence community here at the Capitol and within within the intelligence community um, uh, around the region and around the world uh, or around the nation anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, the way we uh, the way we share it, the way we disseminate it, but the way we use it, that's another key is that we're, we're using the intelligence that we have to inform our operational decisions. And it goes back to uh, Ms. Herrera Butler's uh, uh, question about uh, the, the fence. I mean, this, you know, the, the, the criteria we use um, comes largely from the intelligence that we have about uh, an event upcoming. So, um, so we're, we're making sure that we share uh, information, that we disseminate it to our own people and that we use it correctly. Thank you. And uh, just a, a quick question um, for the um, for the general. If if you had your preference, would these law enforcement coordinators? I completely support your plans for regionalizing and trying to get former law enforcement. Would you ultimately like to see that reside under your office? Or do you think that would be a more efficient way to hire and train and coordinate with local law enforcement than the individual members designating someone on their staff? Thank you, Representative Clark, for the question. I, I think um, it, it would, it should come to the Capitol. I'm not sure if it should be the House Sergeant at Arms or the United States Capitol Police. 
Uh, they have a lot on their plate already, but um, as I think about it and, and answer your question, I do think it should most likely be under police services of the House Sergeant at Arms or, or under the Capitol Police in their operational division. Because at the end of the day, police talk to police. So as Chief Major has said, and, and we are both members of IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Fraternal Order Police, we go to these organizations. People, police chiefs know us, but when you make those phone calls, police officer to police, police chief to police chief, they're, they're very effective. But to have a standardized across the board for 441 members, this is what a law enforcement coordinator is, and this is what it is not. And then to have, best case scenario, two of them, two of them, and these are people that really know law enforcement work, protection, uh, assessment, security threats, and threat mitigation. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, appreciate it. Oh, thank you uh, to the panel for sticking around. We held you an extra 10 minutes. We've got you know, a lot more questions. I think, Mr. Bland, real quick, I think, do we need to have a uh, classified or private briefing from, from you on, on some of these issues with regard to the hardening of the capital and those kind of things? Uh, yes, Chairman, I, I would welcome that and welcome also uh, a discussion of the uh, comprehensive physical security assessment as well in, in a classified setting. Yeah, I, th I think we should do that. And, uh, you know, obviously sooner rather than later. And also, you know, with some of the intelligence stuff too, uh, Chief, I think we should, you know, we should do that in a private setting. I don't think we want to tip our hand anybody as to what the Capitol looks like uh, now versus a year ago. Uh, but just uh, you all have given us assurances that it's much safer today than it was. I think the Chief touched upon, you know, some of the things that from the intelligence perspective and getting the word out to the rank and file members, but we should definitely do something uh, in, in a skiff to be able to really understand this uh, in a way so that we can make the arguments for the needs to our colleagues based upon that information. And, uh, you know, we certainly want to keep it going, but to the, to the extent you all can continue to speak up, uh, you carry a lot of weight with the members uh, around this place. And I think the more you speak up on member security, on you know the, the the needs, Chief. I, you know, I'm I'm looking at our our police departments back home, uh, in the, the the labor situation back home, and uh, you know, to get 288 up in the next year is going to be you know a grind. So we want to do everything we can to try to help you make that happen. Because I know if it's the case, there's still 15 or 20 applicants for every one uh, uh, officer that you'll be able to swear in. Is that still about right? Yes, it is. Okay, so we got some work to do. Uh, I want to thank all our staff on on the uh, uh, subcommittee for helping put this together. I want to thank Ms. Herrera Butler and, and the panel, and, and we'll be seeing you all real soon in a classified setting. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.